Fresh from the Hollywood Hills after party. Uh, why would you speak for yourself? <laughs> Two computers out today, because I got double the work to do to try to justify DD slippers making it past the night. Marcel Swally, Emmanuel Acho in the building. Right, What's up, Emmy Acho? What's up, big dog? You good? I'm good. Mm. I don't know. All right, we're going to get on that tie later. I got to do this. Let's get it started. My Clippers. Yeah, they took a big A on Saturday. That was a long time ago. And now we're down 3-1 to the Suns. Paul George had a team high 23 points, but he also only hit one three-pointer and nine tries. He also missed free throws down the stretch again. The Clippers were ice cold in the fourth quarter, missing nine straight shots at one point in the loss. So, Acho, how much do the Clippers' struggles fall on PG? Playoff P, PG. No? Uh, I, no. I, I won't say exclusively, well, don't but say in large, did. large, large part on PG. So if you are going to be a top player, if you're going to be the superstar, if you are going to be the leader of the team, then you got to take the brunt of the blame. And when I look at PG, so you can't have three of your four games shooting less than 28% from the three-point line. Random number, 28. <laughs> well, okay, 30%. That's <laughs> so random. random. <laughs> three of the four games, PG shot worse than so 40% what? from the field. And so well, that's everything. So I'm not even going to get into oh. the free throw woes. We can talk about that later. Oh. But when Kawhi got hurt, everybody's role had to change. Mm. And PG, his role had to change as well. Okay. One, What's he that? had to become a better scorer. Two, he had to become a more efficient scorer. But three, he had to become a more efficient leader. Kawhi already hurt. And we already know Kawhi is not a vocal leader. Oh. But at least Kawhi is going to lead by his play. PG, you cannot be void of being a vocal leader and also be void of leading by play. It can't happen. Ooh. And right now we're seeing both of these things occur. So, oh, again, I won't use the word exclusively. Instead, I'll use the word solely. And to me, the blame falls solely on PG. Solely? Because if you are going to be the fearless leader, I need you to lead and lead fearlessly. Uh, that was the take. Well done. Um, theoretically, it, it applies, but pragmatically, like if you actually watch this team in the dynamic, oh no, all he gets is participation blame. And that's what anybody on any team that steps on the field, steps on the court. You get this much blame. Now, if you want to go and exaggerate that, if you want to go in excess of that participation blame, oh, you can't look at Paul George, not at all. The dynamic shifted right before his very eyes, and he adjusted on the fly. Actually, I think Paul George adjusted better than anybody else because he had the hardest leap to take. Think about it. When you're number two, you're cushioned. Track and field, let's go. All right, you're in front of me, Acho. I don't know what race this is. This boy ain't going to never beat me in anything. But you're in front of me somehow. And a flat top, all that is drafted for me. Oh, good job. Oh, I ain't got nothing. You taking all the win. I'm in a great position. All of a sudden, they say, Acho falls out. You're the rabbit. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. It's on me now. That's a different position yes, versus sir. somebody who's going from three to two, four to three, yep, et cetera, yep, yep, yep. correct? I like so that. we know he has a different leap than everyone else. But let's talk, so, let's talk about the tax man, because I know there was a song back in the days before both of us was born, hey, man, I missed the post, man. Let's talk about the tax man, because his money is due. My team is taxed. I ain't going to come up here and lie to y'all. We spent, spunt, whatever you want to say, we done. Not necessarily in winning these games, but in terms of energy. We've been sapped. And the tax man in real life is going to go after those who earn the most, correct? Mm -hmm. Except those guys who know how to play with the taxes and they pay zero, Jeff Bezos. I don't know how it happens, but it happens. But in sports, you know what the tax man does? He looks at the guy who actually does the most and taxes him first. Who is rising all these boats in terms of tide? Paul George, what out? You, you, you don't believe me? You don't believe me? Cameraman, ISO, forget me. Let's see Acho's face right now. Look at this show. Imagine. All right, close your eyes real quick, Acho. There's a world where there's no Kawhi. Okay. And they're playing. And then now there's no PG. What is that team doing right now? Taking L's? Uh, uh, no, open your eyes. They're taking vacation spots with the Lakers. That's what they're doing. <laughs> they are out the playoffs. You can't do this. You can't look at Paul George and give him excess blame. Well, without Paul George, they wouldn't be in this position in the first place. Ah, uh, no, no, no. You were with me up until that last no, kind me. of convoluted, faulty logic. Here's why Paul George got to take blame, Sal. So. And we got the full screen. When I think about players in the playoffs who are scoring more than 20 points per game, Paul George is shooting the worst percentage of all of those players. What does that tell me? <laughs> of all the dudes that's getting buckets, Paul George is the least efficient at getting his buckets. And there's eight cats up there, Sal. It's not coincidence that the Clippers are struggling the most if their leader is struggling the most. I also look at it like uh, this. Uh, PG, 
It's two games that were toss-up games. Just toss up like a jump ball. Two games in this series thus yeah. far. Y'all are down three, one, two were toss-ups. Well, one of those toss-up games, game two, that y'all lost, it was eight seconds left. You were shooting two free throws. You desperately needed to make both. Please at least just make one. You make none. Okay, y'all lose that game. Toss-up game. Y'all go down 2-0. Well. Y'all win game three. Game four, another toss-up game. Can you tie up the series 2-2? It's 6.3 seconds left. You're down by three. I believe it's 79 mm. or 76. Mm. We need you to make both free throws. Mm. You missed the first one. So now what you got to do? What you got to do? Now you got to go miss the second one. You execute that, because apparently you're better at missing free throws now than you are making them. You execute that. You missed the free throw. Boogie Cousins gets it. He goes up to the foul line. But had you made the first one, now Boogie Cousins is going up to tie the game. Instead, you missed the first wow, one. Now Boogie bad, Cousins bad. is going up to still wow. be down, even if he does make both. It's even Paul George's fault in a micro sense. We know it's his fault in a macro sense. We know it's his fault It's Paul large. George's fault. Yes, sir. Of yes, what? Sir. We know it's that, that, that the Clippers are down in the series, first and foremost. So, two of the games have been decided by a combined five points. Okay. Two games have been My decided point. by a combined two possessions. My point. Paul George had the ball with under eight seconds in both of those games at the free throw line. You make those free throws, the game changes drastically. It's Paul George's fault in micro, and I would blame Paul George also macro. It's only the short-sighted man that looks at the end and then realizes where he's fallen, where he's failed. But us, who've been through the rigors, who've been through professional athletics, know, oh, it starts way before you guys see the result. Preparation is the separation yes, before we even get on the field to play. If you don't win Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday in our game, it don't matter what you're going to try and do on Sunday, okay? Let's transfer that to the sport of basketball. Are you trying to tell me that this team that has all of a sudden put the clamps down on Phoenix in terms of point production? You want to talk about Phoenix first three games? And then also now, look at PG and what he's done to this team. He's playing more minutes than anybody else as out there. As he should. As he should. And then you look at the team without him on the court, minus 24. With him on the court, plus 47. You want to keep talking about my team? Let's keep talking about my team. Because my team is fighting a narrow, close death. We know it. With Kawhi out, most people say, well, good luck to them. Oh, my God. There is some hope with this team. Why is there hope? Because Paul George is playing insane basketball. Now, he has his micro moments of failure. True. But to exaggerate that to the point where you're going to overlook these stats and these numbers, game four, lowest score game, NBA game of the season. That's defense. That's Paul George as well. You don't count that side of the court, obviously. Clippers got into a hole 14-2. And that's what I'm talking about when you want to look at the finish line. You want to look at the missed free throw. And you want to talk about the fact that we were down 12 before we even blinked. That's the hole that we dug ourselves into that was hard to get out of. Reggie Jackson had 20 points. You want to talk about Reggie Jackson, who's a beast? But he shot 33 from the field. You didn't bring that up. Why, why not? Oh. 22 from three. Anybody? I thought that's our second-best player right now. Mm, I keep it 100. I keep it objective. Marcus Morris, game worst, minus 10, plus minus. Anybody? Anybody want to talk? You don't want to vote? Oh, you want to talk about Paul George with one free throw. Okay, let's keep going. Shot 16% from three in game four. Second-worst three-point percentage of the season. But it's on Paul George only, huh? Exclusively. Look, man, I give him standard operating fee in terms of blame. But outside of that, you got to look at everybody before you look at Paul George. You sweating like Paul I George is. I am on is. fire up in here. Um, he got me on twist. Let me break this down, and this is why I'm done, So You know it's PG's fault if this. What? Your best player cannot play your worst. In the NBA right now, we oh, talk about God. the illustrious 50, oh. 40, 90 guys. 50% yeah. from the field, 40% from three, 90% from the stripe. Mm -hmm. In the NBA, we praise those dudes, the illustrious guys, the best of the best of the best, playing the best of the best of the best. Paul George was a 2011 <laughs> 66 guy. He oh, shot 20% from the field. That don't sound like 50, 40, 90. <laughs> he shot 11% from three. Okay. And he shot 66% from free. That's the throws. Paul George is 20, 11, 60. So your best player <laughs> huh? cannot play your worst huh? in your biggest moments. And Paul George is the best player, and he is playing the worst in the biggest moment. You just said Reggie Jackson was 8 for 24. Paul George was still worse, 5 for 20. Marcus Morris, 2 for 8. That breaks down to 1 for 4. Paul George was still worse, 5 for 20. Mm. Paul George, 12 for 18 from the free throw line. If he just shoots... 85% from the free throw line, y'all still win, statistically speaking. 12 for 18, about? big dog. So, 
In the biggest moments, you know what they say. What they big say. time players make big time plays in big time games. It was a huge game. You came on the show Friday, said y'all no. can't go down 3-1. Y'all yeah, yeah. can't rebound from that. Paul George, knowing it. everything is on the line, one it. for nine from three? Say 11%? Dog, dog, you dog. could go 11% from three, big no, dog. First of all, With all would, due respect. First of all, I would not. I would go higher. <laughs> Second of all, um, you better start respecting who carrying the water on these Clippers because that's Paul George. Now, it's so funny when you get into life and the team dynamics, it's never even in terms of the blame and in terms of the praise. It's never even, even though it should be at times. Because if you look at Paul George, he put them in a position where they actually have a chance. But now we're going to shoot them out the sky for bringing them this high. That's crazy. And I got a Boys and Men song for you. Ready? <clears throat> How could I see Kawhi? <laughs> I mean, damn what Kawhi is. <laughs> Ass out that box and get on the court. I'm sorry, he hurt for real, so I understand that. We are winning this matchup in terms of point score, 403 to 400. That matters. Paul George is putting in a position where there is a winning position, but you don't want to respect that. A lot of people tell me all the time that my Clippers are cursed. It's funny, that's why I'm a Clippers fan, because they're underdogs. People told me when I was growing up, and I didn't even know what curse meant, other than my grandma used to curse a lot. They used to always say, oh, you curse, because why? Because you're here, you're here, you're from there, and you did that. Man, shut up. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I don't give a damn what you think it is. But listen to this. We lost a two-time finals MVP. Yep. Game one of the series was 36 hours after the last game seven that we had to play. Game six we had to play. Then you look at that. We play Phoenix. We go through the Valley Oop game. Oh, gosh. And we still only down 3-1. Why I say only? Because the Clippers always been cursed when they were up 3-1. People look at you like that. Now we got the flip. We got Ty Lue in a position to do this. You're the person that, when I was growing up, looked at their parents. Parents. My parents, man. Mama had two kids by the age of 19. Look at your face. You pulling at your heartstrings right now. <laughs> ah, my daddy worked at a gas station, man, when he met my mama. Worked at a post office years later. My mom didn't work at all. Okay. She was dedicated to the family unit. You're the type of person that looks at my parents and says, okay, you put us in position to succeed, but what position is this? That's not how you look at Paul George. He put us in a position to succeed. Don't you dare talk about him working at the gas station. Don't you dare talk about him being committed to his <laughs> team like that. But Paul George, without you, where will we be? Love you, mama. Love you, daddy. Coming up, we'll tell you if Pat Prescott and Mike McCarthy are uh, do the most pressure for a quarterback coach duo. Was that a stretch or what? <laughs> but first, Kevin Durant does not want praise after losing in the playoffs. I'll tell you if his first healthy season in Brooklyn was a success. Next on Speak for Yourself. Kevin Durant had a playoffs to remember, averaging 34 points, but he doesn't want any praise. KD said, quote, I'm getting congratulations. I didn't do anything. We lost. Durant missed last season with an injury, but he added that he already had big games before. Said, quote, I didn't feel like anything. It didn't feel like anything special to me because we lost. Now, first thing I got to say is this, Sam. What you got to do? If I was to come out and say KD didn't do nothing special, they lost, everybody would be like, how dare you criticize KD? KD might even shoot at me on Twitter if I said uh, that. But he said that. Yeah. So let's just all establish. Yeah. The man himself said he didn't do nothing special mm. because they lost. Mm. Now, I got to ask you, Marcellus. Uh, was KD's first healthy season with the Nets a success? Absolutely. And just to clarify what KD really you meant. You don't need clarification. Okay, you <laughs> I know you just want to run with that. Okay. You think it's a pass to shoot at KD? Do it. I did. <laughs> um, false humility is, is so thinly veiled as a lie. And I hate when people do that. Like, in my school, ninth grade, Tiffany Cambridge used to walk in ninth grade, most beautiful person on the planet. Yep, certainly for ninth grade. She set a ninth grade record. Uh, <laughs> no, she wore heels in the ninth grade. It was a real thing. It was crazy. And she show up to class late every day, because she could. And then we would be like, whoa. Now, if, if Tiffany like, ah, oh, this little thing, oh, man, man, stop. False humility. We know you know you fine. Kevin, did, Kevin Durant even said it. Yeah, I, I, I balled, but who cares? Because we lost. So this is false humility. Now, with that said, let me get into my take. Why was this a success for the Brooklyn Nets? Let me give it to you simple, because I'm going to give it to the way that you like to give it. Last time we saw the Nets in the NBA Finals, oh, my God, it was 2003. Well, last time they made it past the conference semifinals as well. Think about that. Doesn't that sound eerily familiar to a take that you always throw my way and I just slap it down about Baker Mayfield and the Cleveland Browns and, oh, where they been and how lowly the times have been of recent times until Baker Mayfield comes and takes them to one playoff win? Well, then, damn, 
Share the love. Kevin Durant takes them to the conference semis, and this is a team that's been in the drought since 2003 with the same level of success. Beyond everything else that I could shower your way about Kevin Durant's greatness, it's the fact that this is a franchise that has struggled more so than not. Only six playoff appearances in the last 14 seasons. You're going to look at them like, what? That doesn't matter. It does. That shows impact with Kevin Durant. Only thing that's keeping Kevin Durant right now from continuing to play basketball this season, this postseason, was injury around him. Be real about that. Then you got no take because Kevin Durant had a tremendous season, was a successful season, especially the impact it had on his organization. The season for Kevin Durant was a failure. Is that false humility? No, that's... It was a failure. A and I'm going to agree with everything Kevin Durant said. Man, like, on. the season for Kevin Durant was a failure. Did he hit a big shot? Absolutely. But when we think about this season for the Brooklyn oh, Nets and Kevin Durant, what is the first image that comes to mind? Fade away, jumper, left foot on the line, goes into overtime in a game in which they lost. The season for Kevin Durant was a failure. Here's why, I sell. Early on, when you young and when you in, in high school and middle school, Class is A, B, C, D. That is the scale. Then when you get to college... Uh, F. And, uh, well, hopefully yeah, you I'm about to say, boy, don't act like you ain't got no F before. <laughs> then you get into college. The scale is, again, on letter grades, A, B, C, D, E. But once you've taken a certain amount of classes, you can start to take electives. And once you reach a certain grade in college, you start to take what are pass-fail Courses. Okay, you did that. Kevin Durant has reached a certain level of achievement in his NBA career where every course, every season is now pass or fail. It's no longer time to grade a great like Kevin Durant, Durant on an A, B, C, D scale, especially not Fs. Oh, like every it. season like for Kevin Durant like is now pass or fail. Did you win a chip? Did you go to the finals or did you not? LeBron James is not graded on letters anymore. L.A., his first year there, it was a failure. He got hurt. They didn't make the playoffs. The Lakers, this past year, it was a failure. Anthony Davis got hurt. LeBron James was maligned. They did not make it to the conference finals, nor did they make it to the finals. Kevin Durant, this year, it was a failure. Because when you put Kevin Durant on a squad, Kevin Durant does not lead that team to a conference championship. At this stage in his prime, that's a failure. Now, I'm going to close my first lap by simply Please asking you all do this. get around that track. Even if you said, Marcellus, that KD is on a Brooklyn Nets team with Joe Harris, Blake Griffin, and some other role players, there is no Kyrie, there is no Harden, we both would have said they'll probably get to the conference finals. Like, let's see, who's in the East? Okay, yeah, they're, they're better than the Knicks, regardless. They're still better than the Hawks, regardless. They're definitely better than the Wizards, regardless. Yeah, they're, they're good, just as good as... Eh, they're probably better than the Sixers, regardless. Sixers can't stay healthy. And Giannis, he's not clutch. We know Giannis ain't clutch, so they're probably still better. They're at least going to get to the Eastern Conference Finals, even if there is no Kyrie, there is no Harden. So don't now retroactively say, well, they didn't have Harden, they didn't have Kyrie. What can you expect? Even a team with... Kevin Durant and no other superstar, we would automatically think they're good enough to make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. So Kevin Durant was right. This season wasn't a success. This season was a failure. Man, stop. Stop. Just stop. Hi Pass fail, huh? Pass fail. In the NBA, you want to take that from school, which if you take it, first of all, if you take a pass fail to me, I'm already thinking, dog, you ain't that smart. Anyway, do you? I'm not going to judge all pass-fail classes because I ain't take all pass-fail classes. I just judge the ones I know. Um, but I know if you were to translate that to the NBA, it would look like a 97% grade for passing and 3% meant you failed because only one team wins a championship. And according to Acho, if you don't win a championship, you fail. That's what it sounded like in my career. For a great like for, Kevin Durant. Yes, sir. Great, oh, is Steph Curry great? Yes, sir. Was it a failure? It was a failure. This, this year was a failure for Steph Curry. Don't you I think he would get him? say so? I ain't should get him. Do you I not ask? think that he would say so, Sal? I don't oh, care you what think you Steph say. Curry wants the scoring titles? No. Steph Curry wants NBA titles. No, no. I, hold on. I don't care what they say. It's what they do. Now, all these dudes going to get... I, I've been to the podium before and lied to every fan I could to keep them checks going and to keep the peace. Because you're a liar. <laughs> but in reality, dog... You think Steph Curry felt like he failed this season when he, he, he returned from injury? He, didn't make the he returned from injury, MVP candidate. We got et Warriors fans oh. in our ear oh. as producers. Y'all tell me.
Was it a success for Steph Curry? Was it a success for the Warriors? Um, no. Actually, that, if you actually, do not make that the note playoffs, came from the Warriors producer. <laughs> <if> you, <laughs> said, okay, what about Steph Curry? <laughs> <laughs> if you do not what? make the playoffs what? and you are a future first ballot Hall of Famer, so, look at it like this, Sel. When we look back, on, got you, when we look back on Kevin Durant's Get career. Out. When we look back on Get out. The fans got you. Hey. What the hell? Flash it Failure. Failure? When we look back on Kevin... Let's calm down, because it's getting hot. OK. Right. When we look back on Kevin Durant's career, what can he say to this? How does this year you, add to his legacy? Uh, you want to know how it adds? The only way is an all-star game. That's nope. the only thing. Like, he, he didn't win a scoring title. He didn't win an MVP. He didn't go to the finals. He didn't even lose the finals. Oh, so he nothing didn't... happened, huh? All-time points per game leader. He's third on that list. But you're saying, oh, just add to that rebounding from a torn Achilles coming out there and it's being great Kevin Durant. Folklore. It's not great. It's great in folklore. It's great in... He Ooh, came though. back from an Achilles. Let me say he this. He hit a turnaround jumper in a game that he Life is not won. played out on IG or in folklore. It's played out in your mirror if you really want to get real. Mark Twain, life is a competition between you and yourself. You think Kevin Durant ain't sitting there satisfied to some degree that he proved to himself that he could beat Kevin Durant again after that injury? It oh, didn't yes. feel like anything special to me because we lost. Kevin Durant. You know why we don't have a lot of athletes on this show? Tell the truth. Since you want to be so truth-telling, tell the truth. Why we don't have a lot of athletes and we talk nothing but sports on this show? Because they don't tell the truth. They come over here and say, yeah, I'm promoting this brand, and yeah, oh, yeah, go fans. And, and that's the reason why I'm here, you're here to decode the message. And the message being decoded is Kevin Durant like, dog, I can't say this because it's going to be an excuse. It won't be looked at as a reason. But I lost two-thirds of the engine. You try to ride around in a dusty Bentley with two thirds of the engine going. Where you going, Acho? You're not going far. First and that's what off, happened to the squad. The, I just got a new whip, and it's a What'd hybrid. It's oh, a hybrid. Nice. Lexus finally gifted me. Oh, they hooked you up. What do you mean? And it's a hybrid. So a even if the engine is not necessarily fully functioning, guess what? Gonna kick in What's gonna the kick? electric part. Well, he ain't got Kevin. that. If, whose fault is that? Oh, the greats. Wow, the greats. <laughs> the greats. Which Kevin Durant. Oh here's the here's the issue, y'all. Here's, you are here's what makes me I'm pull my hair out. Okay, okay. And thankfully, I got enough hair to pull out and still have a full head. Is this? Is Kevin Durant great or is he not? He is, is great. Is he Mount Rushmore or is he not? If he is, hold which on, he Mount, is. Hold on, hold on. Mount Rushmore is only four dudes. Don't of do this that. generation. Somebody Don't. said somebody tweeted it means he said he's Mount Rushmore of this generation. I I'm told you they, I told you this I'm world ain't myself, lived on Countries ain't got different Mount Rushmore. So there's one Mount Rushmore. <laughs> but if he's a Mount Rushmore on, player man. of this generation, if yeah. he's that great, we got to treat him as such, big dog. I do. Can, no. I here's, do. Here's what y'all do. It's not titles or and nothing, you do, though. too. Here's I don't what, do titles Here's what everybody does. Carl Malone's a great. Where are you going to go? He we, a failure we career? We act like Kevin Durant is great and the greatest when we want to, when it suits our argument. But then when we look and say, you got bounced in the conference semis, we don't treat him as a great. Oh, really? LeBron James' this season, it was a failure. LeBron James' first year in L.A., it was a failure. LeBron James' first year for the Miami Heat, it was a failure because he is great, if not one of the greatest, and he did not win a title. LeBron James isn't boasting, yeah, we played the Mavs, we went to the NBA Finals, but we lost, there. but it was our first year. LeBron James isn't going to L.A. like, yeah, I mean, I had a quad injury, but it's my first year in L.A., baby, so it don't matter. <laughs> no, LeBron is like, my first year with the Heat was a failure. Second year, I had to get right. My first year in L.A., it was a failure. Second year, I had to get right. This first year for Kevin Durant, it was a failure. Oh, Hopefully, man. in the second year, they get right. But I will not lower the bar for the greatest player playing the game right now. I'm not going to do it. Well, one, you didn't put the bar up there to lower the bar. What you're really talking about is this outwardly expression that justifies what you do. And I'm sorry, that's what's leading to a lot of psychosis in this world. People keep looking for validation outside when really, it ain't about that. Let's talk about how most communication is nonverbal. So I don't give a damn what you say, Kevin Durant. I don't give a damn what LeBron says. And his way of expressing himself is not, can I boast or did I fail? You gave me that juxtaposed. Failure or boasting? Let me just tell you what this is about. Was Karl Malone's career a failure? Was Charles Barkley's career a failure? No, no. But they both didn't win a championship. But according to Acho, okay, I ain't mad at that take. I just don't want to hear that take in its entirety. Let's talk about what's really going on here. Let's <laughs> Boy, you over here. Where these fans got you sussed up? Let's talk about this. Basketball gods. This is only, the only problem going on right now is he needs to pay his tithe to the basketball gods. Basketball gods don't like victories. They don't like dynamic duels. They don't like anything GMs didn't do, okay? You go all the way back to the time and time when the Celtics had their 
nine Hall of Famers on one roster. In the 80s, Celtics, Lakers, 90s, Jordan Bull. Oh, look up, there's Dennis Robin. Oh, look up, there's Michael Jordan with Scottie Pippen and Dennis Robin. Stop it. All of a sudden, LeBron James becomes the one who steps out there and says, you know what, I'm going to form my own big three. But remember, between the Jordan's Bulls and LeBron and the decision, there was Shaquille O'Neal with Kobe Bryant and Gary Payton and Carl Malone and all them. I don't know what super team that was, but it was a failure. Now let's add to your ammunition, because you know me, I ain't trying to argue. I'm just trying to disagree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw that Lakers team not win a championship. Then all of a sudden, I saw Miami first year not win a championship. Miami's last year, the Heatles didn't win a championship. You talk about going to Golden State, their last year they didn't win a championship. Kobe and Shaq took four years to win a championship. Lakers first year without LeBron didn't win a championship. I can't deem all that as failure. Some of that is stepping stones, some of that is success, but success is not linear. So when you say failure, pass, fail, I'm looking at guys who had tremendous seasons this year that did not win it all. And I dare you, I dare you to walk up to them and say, yo, this season was a failure. Here's how I'm going to break it down for yeah, you. That's why it I love when y'all watch this it. show, because Sale makes me smarter. I try to make him smarter. We collectively try to make Man, you all sweat. smarter. You can have macro success. OK, now we're talking. And micro failures. Yes! You can have macro success, yes. micro failures. Within a basketball game, yes. you can miss a free throw. Thank and that's you. a failure. Yeah. But you can ball in that game and win, and that's successful. Thank Within a football game, you can have four sacks, and that is a, a, a success. But you can jump off sides on a game-clinching play, cost your team the game, and that play micro is a failure. Mm. Kevin Durant has clearly had a macro successful career, big picture. This year, too. But in the micro, exclusively looking at this year getting bounced in the conference semis, that is a failure. Kevin Durant had a micro failure this season, although he has had a macro, incredibly successful career. This year, micro, just looking at this one year alone, there was nothing great to write about this year. What? You lose in Game 7 to a Bucks team that we don't even think has a dog on that team. At least they tried to tell us that. There's nothing great micro about this, this season. Macro, we might look back and say, well, he still made an All-Star team, check. Uh, he, he hit a big shot, check. He had a 49, 17, and 10 game check. But when you just look at it in the micro, in the right now, in this moment, this year was a failure. It may contribute to a successful career, but the year for Kevin Durant, it was a failure, and he said so himself. Yeah, but you know what? We did have a lot to write about. D the right, they led every story, every show. They only played eight games together, and we couldn't talk about them enough. We talked about them eight times a show, and they only played eight games this regular season together. There were no ink left in the pens from these writers when they were done with them. Let me tell you this. this is, is this Impact? Second most popular team in merchandise sales, Brooklyn Nets. Come on. Are they the second best team? Nope. Matter of fact, they have the sixth worst record since the last time they've been in the finals. Sixth worst record in the NBA since then. And you're talking about Impact? Let me tell you impact. If I have four sacks and I jump off sides, coach come up to me tripping. Hey, bro, <laughs> you better chill. Coming up, there's a lot of pressure on Dak Prescott and Mike McCarthy. But is it more than Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford? We'll answer that next on Speak for Yourself. Four sacks? <laughs> Tonight on FS1, the biggest soccer tournament of the year, wraps this group play as Bolivia battles Argentina. Mm. It all kicks off tonight, 7 Eastern on FS1 and the Fox Sports app. That's my son's favorite sport right there. It's Super Bowl or bust for the Rams, according to our own Bucky Brooks, who said the duo of Matthew Stafford and Sean McVay are under the most pressure. But what about over in Dallas? It's round two for Dak Prescott and Mike McCarthy. Ding, ding! And Dak is expected to be back from his season-ending ankle injury a year ago. Bucky is joining us now. So, Bucky, which duo is under more pressure, McVay and Stafford or Dak and McCarthy? Oh, it absolutely has to be Sean McVay and Matthew Stafford. When I look at this team, this team has mortgaged their future to win right now. And what's interesting about it, Sean McVay had a quarterback who was a successful quarterback, and he elected to move on. Jerry Goff was 42 and 20 under Sean McVay. The LA Rams had gone to the Super Bowl with Jerry Goff at quarterback. They were winning and in the playoffs again. Sean McVay made a decision that he wanted more at the position. So he traded away a couple first round picks. The Rams now don't have a first round selection until 2024. And he did it for a quarterback 
who has zero playoff wins, only four winning seasons in his career, and the only way that he can justify this move being better than what he previously had with Jerry Goff, he has to not only get to the Super Bowl, but he has to win the Super Bowl. That's a ton of pressure for a guy who's never won a playoff game. Mm. I like where you're at, Bucky Brooks, but when I think about pressure again, I always correlate pressure, Bucky, to expectations. Now, here's what we know. Dak Prescott is making more money than Matthew Stafford, so expectations monetarily are higher. Based on rankings of we've talked about all offseason long, aggregate rankings of different sites, Dak Prescott is ranked higher than Matthew Stafford. Dak Prescott is in the top 10 of every quarterback ranking category. Matthew Stafford falls around 10, 11, 12, etc. So, Dak is paid more, and Dak is ranked higher. Mike McCarthy's actually been to and won a Super Bowl. Sean McVay has not. So Mike McCarthy has done something higher than Sean McVay has, thus the expectations are greater. Bucky, if the expectation for the quarterback of the Cowboys and the coach for the Cowboys is greater than the expectation for the quarterback and the coach of the Rams, to me it's a no-brainer that Dak Prescott and McCarthy are under more pressure. <laughs> but I also offer you this, and I think this is the strongest point of it all. Only one of these four parties that we have mentioned is real, really has a job on the line. Sean McVay, Matthew Stafford, Dak Prescott, Mike McCarthy. Only one of those four's job is up this year. Because Sean McVay, you know he's safe. The last four years for Sean McVay, bald. Matthew Stafford, you know he's safe. He ain't going nowhere. Dak Prescott just got paid a boatload of money. He's not going anywhere. But Mike McCarthy, hmm. Mike McCarthy is the one individual who people are going to look around like, wait a second. Maybe he's the problem. So since Mike McCarthy is the only person who actually could lose his job this year, depending upon that play, I think McCarthy and Dak under way more pressure than those stars out here in L.A. No, I, I think it's a no-brainer, and I agree with you, Bucky. It's McVay and Stafford. Think about it. Sean McVay did mortgage the future. Think about what he did. He basically gave us this equation. He said, I had a quarterback take me to the Super Bowl that was lesser than the one I just got in trade acquisition. So guess what everyone's going to say? All right, that sounds great. That means you got to do even better. Now, how much better can you do than a Super Bowl appearance? You got to win it all. Imagine somebody say, touch the ceiling, and you're on the floor. You're like, oh, I can do that. But then you're already up there, and it's like, well, it ain't that much room to breathe. Now go touch it. It should be that simple. Oh, is it going to be that simple for Sean McVay? Hell no. It's going to be like he underground trying to jump up there because he got Matthew Stafford. Matthew Stafford's never won anything in the postseason. And I'm not condemning him. I'm just reflecting what his resume shows. Matter of fact, look at all these quarterbacks from his same draft class 2009. Oh, my God. Started at least one playoff game. Of those, 11 yet to win a game. 0-4, Andy Dalton. 0-3, Matthew Stafford. 0-2, Mr. Trubisky. And Carson Wentz and seven others. 0-1. Mm -mm -mm. But this is just the age-old battle of outcome versus performance. Outcome versus performance. Let me give it to you like this. Tom Brady has better outcomes than the performances of his nemesis, if you want to call him that, Aaron Rodgers. But Aaron Rodgers has better performances than Tom Brady, but Tom Brady has better outcomes. So it seems like Sean McVay just said, look, I want a better outcome, so I want to go get a better performer. Problem is, that guy's never performed well when you need him most in the postseason. So it's going to be interesting to see if Sean McVay can make it as simple as touching the ceiling when he's that close already to it. Uh, but here's really the pivotal difference that you all aren't either seeing or at least are not acknowledging. Remember, Sel, Mike McCarthy, you could almost say, like, he's out on parole of being sorry. Right? Like, Mike McCarthy... <laughs> say that again, <laughs> just because it's so funny. Mike McCarthy is sorry. out on parole of being sorry. <laughs> oh, like, he got to live up to certain responsibilities what? before we throw him back behind these bars of sorriness. What do I mean? <clears throat> Mike McCarthy, oh, y'all, has had three consecutive losing seasons. Okay, the last four years, let's look at Mike McCarthy versus Sean McVay. The last four years, Mike McCarthy, 17, 26, and 1, 40% win percentage. Sean McVay, 43, 21, six, uh, four winning seasons to mm. Mike McCarthy's no winning seasons. Keep in mind, Mike McCarthy got fired for a season in there. Also, Sean McVay has made it to a Super Bowl. The person who's under more pressure the mm. group that is under more pressure is the person who is out on parole realizing that they are one bad action away from being sent right behind those bars of being sorry. 
Mike McCarthy, <laughs> three losing seasons consecutively. You are one losing season away. You know how it is. You one strike. You one losing season away from being sent back to where you were. And that is in head coaching purgatory on the streets, hoping an owner will give you a sleepover so you can get another job. Mike McCarthy and Dak, they under more pressure, big dogs. No, 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 no. no. This is a situation where the pressure is not only on Matthew Stafford, but on Sean McVay, because Sean McVay is on the verge of being considered the emperor with no clothes. Oh. Meaning he was the weird kid, the guy that we celebrated, the offensive genius, until we got to the Super Bowl and we saw the New England Patriots undress him. They took apart that offense, and that offense hasn't been the same. Mm. All of the wizardry and the magic stuff that we saw <clears throat> for two years, how we celebrated him, we haven't seen that same wizardry. Does he have another pitch? Does he have something else? He can remove Jerry Goff and put all the blame on him. But the pressure now is on Sean McVay. Show us. Show us how masterful you are with the X's and O's. Show us if you can get this offense back to being a top five offense because he has thrown Jerry Goff under the bus. Yes. Now he has a shot new toy at quarterback. If this offense doesn't look dynamite and electric and capable of winning a Super Bowl, we now know that Sean McVay was simply just borrowing pages from the old Shanahan playbook, and he doesn't have the ability to expand upon it. Oh, that's deep right there. Because people, if you really looked at them last year, they were carrying more by their defense than their offense. Talk about first and total defense, net yards per play, scoring defense, pass defense, third best rush defense, second in sacks. The defense was leading the way in terms of the numbers and statistics. Three and three in the postseason under Sean McVay. Ooh, that's gangster. But let's talk about what else is gangster, because you <laughs> behind the bars of sorriness, that's an amazing line right there, talking about <laughs> what's going on in Dallas right now with Mike McCarthy. But last time I checked, Acho, no, your words can't penetrate Mike McCarthy, because of the two we're talking about right now, he's the one that won a Super Bowl. And I know you don't respect equity, and you don't like, uh, what, the Letterman jackets with patches, but you can't take these patches off, homie. This one says right here, Super Bowl champion Mike McCarthy. You know what Sean McVay says? Still ordering his jacket. So it doesn't say anything. I'm looking at this situation <laughs> right now. Acho is trying to lower the bar. That's what Acho is trying to do. For who? Who the, for who? Didn't you say earlier that, hey, for Kevin Durant, we're not going to lower the bar. We're not going to lower the bar for Sean McVay. Sean McVay, if you up here and you already made the Super Bowl with a, a quarterback that you could throw under the bus, a quarterback you don't even think that good, well, then, damn, when you get Matthew Stafford, who's supposed to be all that? Let's you're talk. going on vacations with him. It got to get higher, not lower. Let me Answer ask you all a question. Okay. Oh, it's question Let's time. Let's talk huh? about it. It's question time. Yeah, I bet it is. It's question time. What this. about <laughs> first date grace? Y'all know what first date grace is. Oh, I got one on you. Grace Let's hear this. First date grace. My homeboy went out with this, uh, with this lovely woman this past weekend. This is you. This is your story. Me. I was, this ain't your homeboy. This is your key going out. I was watching yeah. track meets. It was not. Shut up. It wasn't me. Okay. Now, with that being Kevin said. Kevin Durant up here. My, <laughs> lying his ass. <laughs> my homeboy went out with this woman this past weekend, and he, it didn't go great. It didn't go great. So I looked at him. I said, hey, big dog, it was just y'all's first outing together. Give her a little bit of grace. Getting to know you, you getting to know her. Say, oh, you know I came on this show. What the executives say? Well, Acho, you know, first year, just getting some shows under your belt. Just, you know, figure it out. You know, it's just y'all's first year together. Can't really look at any numbers. Just got to see how y'all build together. Sean McVay, Matthew Stafford. It's their first date. Oh, it's that first season true. together. Oh. Even in the oh, event oh, it oh, doesn't oh. work out. Everybody's just going to say, y'all know it was just a first date. It's the same thing we do with rookie quarterbacks. Ah, well, he was just a rookie. You know, he's just getting acclimated to the system. Same thing we tried to do last year with Mike McCarthy and Dak Prescott. Uh, you know, it's just their first couple games together. You know, just trying to get things under their belt. Mike McCarthy trying to learn the whole Cowboys way. You know, it's bigger stakes out here. Yeah. First date grace is also the reason that Stafford and, uh, and McVay are not under pressure. Okay. Get them yeah, I, I don't know what kind of dating rules you have, but no, we don't do this first day great. We're not waiting on it. I want it hot from the jump. <laughs> I'm not waiting on it. I don't have time for you to get better at it. No, I want you to be a professional from the jump. So I want you to be great out the gate. So Matthew Stafford was drafted number yeah, one overall. He wasn't a developmental player. He wasn't a practice squad player. This is someone who's expected to be a franchise quarterback. So if you're a franchise quarterback and you're celebrated as one of those who can take us to the next level, nah, bro, we're not falling short of the standards. You sat here and talked about Kevin Durant, and we talked about mm. once you sip from the cup, we always expect you to sip from the cup. So, no, I'm not settling for mediocrity. 
I think, what did T.I. say? T.I. and Izzy Isaiah? What I don't want a mediocre. No, I don't want a mediocre. Almost had me liking oh, Iggy, too, after that song. I was like, oh, okay. You like Iggy? I mean, I like that song. like, who that? Hell. Who that? that Man, you're that, going, you going down the hill fast already. You're already going down the hill fast. You do not like Iggy? Iggy could not rap, and Iggy knows that's why Iggy don't rap no more. Here we go. Let's talk about this uh, first like date Iggy. grace this dude done made up. I know when Nacho make up something, like because, that, boy, that, it ain't that, thorough. That, he just made something up. Okay, let's talk first date grace. Yes, sir. Before I get into this first date grace, because I know I'm going to shock you with this one. Um, anybody out there that's ever been on a first date and they uh, their car broke down or something like that? I was thinking about this this week, and I don't know why. Randomly, I was like, imagine going on the first date and you pick her up and all that and your car break down. And you got to change the tire or something. got to call AAA. Anybody that ever happened to, just tweet me. I just want to know that. I digress. Okay, did Cam Newton get first date grace? Oh. <laughs> the Cam Newton did first date grace, and he went on the best date you could with. Bill Belichick picked him up in that stretch limo. They don't even have them anymore. He just Uber his ass. But basically, show up, Cam, let's go. Oh, this date ain't going so well. I ain't hear Acho once talk about first date grace, only when he got to defend his case, which I told you, is going to have some holes in it. This is my motto. Bucky, it sound like you and me, no mediocre. Same here. No date number two if date number one was doo-doo. No date number two. It ain't happening. Like, why would I go out with you again if I was bad or you were bad or we just weren't good together? So I'm not trying to hear first date grace. What I'm trying to hear is that if I'm looking at Sean McVay, Matthew Stafford, mm -hmm. y'all can't play around this year. I understand there's changes on the defensive side. I also see some additions on the offensive side. Deshaun Jackson about the ball and eat. Matthew Stafford has a cannon. And Deshaun Jackson still got those jackrabbit's legs. He's going to get out and catch a lot of balls for you. But no excuses. You told the world that you got better at the most important position. Don't you dare show us an outcome that's not better as well. Coming up is Dane time running out of time with the Blazers. Uh-oh. We'll tell you if he should force his way out of Portland. That's next on Speak for Yourself. The Blazers hired Chauncey Billups as their next head coach. But the move has come with heat due to Billups' sexual assault allegation back in 1997. Our own Chris Haynes says backlash over the coaching hire and concerns about building a championship team could push Dame out the door. Lillard has been called out by fans who think he played a part in the hire. Dame responded on Twitter, Really? I was asked what coaches I like of the names I heard, and I named them. Sorry, I wasn't aware of their history. I didn't read the news when I was seven, eight years old. I don't support those things, but if this is the route y'all want to come at me, say less. So, Acho, should Damian Lillard force his way out of Portland? Yes, yes, and yes. I had to come to the big board for this one. Dame Lillard will get out of Portland, and he should get out of Portland. Now, when I was playing football, I realized one thing. Grown man strength, it came either at 26 years of age or if you had a child, in my experience, whichever came <laughs> first. I knew some strong 19-year-olds because they had kids. What does that got to do with Dame Lillard wanting out of Portland? Simple. Historically in the NBA, you either want to leave a destination you've been at at the age of 31 or when you've been losing for nine consecutive seasons. Whichever comes first, let's talk through the history lesson. We can start with the great big O, Oscar Robertson. Now remember, he played for the Cincinnati Royals, and then at the age of 31, he said, I got to bust a move. He went to the Bucks, won a title, keep it rolling. Beyond him, now you got some more modern day players, the dude, KG, the big ticket. He played first for the Timberwolves, then he said, I got to bust a move. He moves to the Celtics, wins the title. Talk about his teammates, y'all know that dude. Ray Allen, he plays for the Bucks. he plays for the Supersonics. By the age of 31, he's like, I can't do it. My career is fading before my eyes. Gotta bust a move. He goes to the Celtics and win a title. Now remember, what comes first, the age of 31 or nine seasons? Kevin Durant, he played nine seasons, both for OKC, drafted to the Supersonics. By the time he hit them nine seasons, he was like, hey, y'all, I'm tired of losing. Gotta bust a move. He goes to the Warriors, he wins his title. James Harden, we saw the fit he threw after nine seasons in H-Town. He was like, nope, somebody call up KD, somebody call up Kyrie, because nine seasons of losing is just too long. So why does that have to do with Dame? 
He's hit both of the iconic time frames at the same point in time. He turns 31 in July, and he's had nine losing seasons with the Trailblazers. Historically speaking, when you hit that nine-season mark of losing or that age of 31, whichever comes first, you got to go. Dame just happened to hit them both at the exact same time. No Dame time. So to me, that means he's got to go, and he will go. Dame out of there, y'all. Yeah, it is time for him to go right now. If you think about it, the model is shifting, and it's smart for Dame to go. Get him out, out of there. And you got me smart up there, too. Get him out of there. Yeah, at 26. <laughs> 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 Better you got them kids. Oh, boy. It's one of the two. It's a whole different man This came out of you, brother. I get it. Um, the model's shifting right now, Acho, and this is why it's a beautiful time for Dame Lillard to go and take his talents elsewhere. Think about how LeBron James had to sit there in that YMCA. And looked at Dusty, had a button down on because Jay-Z told everybody to stop wearing throwbacks, and he listened. <laughs> suit up. If he would have suited up, people would have respected the decision more. He looked at all Dusty in a button down. They're like, man, ain't nobody trying to hear all that. Here's the thing. Where Dame Lillard sits right now, it's after the aftermath of super team after super team. Mm -hmm. So the resistance is not the same as it was of yesteryear. Let's talk about when the GMs used to make super teams just appear magically out the air. Everyone commended them and liked super teams. I used to watch a team full of Magic, Kareem, Worthy, Byron Scott. Like, they just kept going. Celtics as well. I digress. Now we're at this point of time, 2021, your Dame Dollar. Let me tell Dame what my grandma told me growing up, and I knew this. She said, baby, you know what stops people from succeeding? And I was like, nah, Grandma. And my grandma was not deep. She was straight in your face, shallow, skimming the surface, but right at you direct. She said, the reason most people don't succeed is because they're either scared or they're dumb. And I was like, damn, Grandma, that ain't deep, but that's real. <laughs> and she was like, most people stop short of what they really want to do because they're scared. And then the rest of them was just dumb. They ain't supposed to get there anyway. And I used to always think about that. I felt it was harsh but I felt it just kept hitting bullseye after bullseye. In my failure moments, I started to realize, was I scared or was I not prepared for that? Dane and many others before Dane probably wanted to leave. They knew where their talent should be, but because they got sold the card of loyalty, they kept playing that same damn card, scared. Dame is not dumb because his game is too strong. He got an intelligent genius kind of game that can translate anywhere. But I got to remind him, don't be scared because the last eight NBA champions have finished third or better in the league and win percentage. Oh, but you with the Blazers, y'all haven't been better than fifth best. Okay. Let's go 12 of the last 15 NBA champs have featured at least two All-Stars, and you better get yourself somewhere where them All-Stars continue. I love C.J. McCollum, small school guy, Patriot League, Ivy League. We kind of like brothers from another, but that ain't enough. It's just not going to be enough. They've tried to mix and match this formula so many different times. Dame, don't be scared, because I know you ain't dumb. Get yourself where you want to be. Time to bring in Fox NBA analyst Slick Rick the Luker for more on this one. So, Slick, should Damian Lillard force his way out of Portland? Hell no, he shouldn't force his way out of Portland, particularly not because of the Twitter trolls that may be suggesting that uh, Chauncey Billups was a bad choice or because of Chauncey Billups' history and Damien should have known better. That's giving social media and the trolls on it way too much influence. It's true. To your guy's point about should he leave because he needs to win a championship, again, I would <laughs> say no, particularly in Damien's case, because the two teams that he would consider, the Los Angeles Lakers and the Utah Jazz, an argument can be made that they are no closer to <clears> winning <throat> a championship than the Blazers are. The Blazers have been to the playoffs eight consecutive years in a row, and one of those years they went to the Western Conference Finals. The Lakers have been to the playoffs the last two years, thanks to LeBron James being there. How much time does he have left as a guy who can lead teams to playoffs, never mind to the championship? And the Utah Jazz, while they've been there five times in a row, they've never been out of the second round. So it's a matter of what does he want and what would cause him to leave. <clears throat> I love the, the whole setup that you had about nine seasons and being 31 years old. That was really crafting a story about hmm. the similarities and why oh, Damian Lillard fits in that so camp. But the only mm -hmm. things that put him in that camp are the fact that he's 31 years old 
and that he's played nine seasons because every other iteration, every yeah. other characteristic of his situation does not fit Kevin Garnett leaving Minnesota because he didn't want to leave Minnesota. Mm -hmm. He got traded to Boston. Ray Allen was a Seattle team with a Seattle team that was rebuilding, so they were looking to move him in order to get draft picks and to get young. And so ultimately what Damian has is he has standing right now as the greatest, second greatest Portland Blazer of all time. Second only to Bill Walton. If he goes to the Lakers or the Jazz, he's not even the best point guard wait a minute. in team history. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, it's a matter of what are you looking oh, for. Duh. Wait a minute, Slick. Now, now you, you forgot yeah. a name in Clyde Drexler, who must I remind yes. you was in Portland for, I want to say, 11 seasons, went to seven consecutive yep. All-Star games, eight out of yep. nine seasons, and he was like, yo, yep. I gots to go. He goes to Houston and instantly wins the chip. Now look, Slick, yeah. you can say maybe, maybe oh, you... Yeah. It's hard yeah, for yeah, me yeah. to fix my lips to say that Dame was better than Clyde, just if you look statistically of what they've both done in their careers Fair. in Portland. Fair. But even Clyde was like, I gotta go. Rasheed Wallace, he was in Portland for, I believe it was eight years. He left to Detroit, instantly won a chip. I also think, though, Slick, that that nine-year mark, if you don't love my 31-year-old mark, look at Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant was in an eerily similar situation to Dame. At a minimum, we can draw those parallels. Their number two, they, they wouldn't have... Nah, their number two was limited. At least the world would say they were limited. Russell Westbrook, C.J. McCollum, number two was limited. They were close, got close. Obviously, KD got closer than Dame did. Harden. You could make the comparison. Harden, his number twos were limited. Russ, maybe you want to argue CP if you want to throw him in there for that year or so. And Harden was like, ah, it's been nine years, man. I got to go. I think Dame is gone. But even going back to Sal's point, and I'm done on my second lap, Sal talked about the fear. And I recently heard this quote. People make changes once the pain of the moment is greater than the fear of the unknown. That's when somebody mm -hmm. finally makes a change. And I think uh, Dame's pain of the moment, losing, is finally going to be greater than his fear of the future. And I think that's why Dame gonna go. Yeah, I'm not saying that it couldn't happen. I'm not saying that the forces that may prompt Damian Lillard at this point in his career to say, you know what, I'm gonna give something else a shot. I'm just looking again based on what he has said his first and second options are, which are the Utah Jazz and the Los Angeles Lakers, <clears throat> if it's about, I want to go someplace to win a ring, if it's the Lakers, and I would say that that's probably the better option between the two in terms of the fit, he gives them exactly what they need, which is a shooter closer at the end of games. That is the element that they were missing being 24th in, in offensive rating this year. But that said, you're putting all of your eggs in the we're going to win one next year because I'm not betting on LeBron James beyond that. And you yourself have said it, Acho. Like, I wouldn't bet on Anthony Davis's health at all. So it's a matter of what am I sacrificing in leaving Portland? And if I'm sacrificing all of that, which is a tremendous amount, Am I going to get what I'm leaving for, which is a ring? And if I don't get it as a Laker next year, then I'm not sure that I ever get it. And now you've lost everything that you built in Portland, and now you're just another Laker who wasn't quite good enough to get it done. Man, this story's got legs. It's getting more intriguing by the day, by the second. Um, Slick, I think you need to flip this around. One of my superpowers is I always think from the perspective of my opponent first, because I already know what I think. So I could go over there first and do a lot more of my homework over there. You keep saying L.A. Why go to L.A.? I don't think it's always a proposition to the individual I must win in L.A. as much as I can lose anywhere, so why not lose in L.A.? <laughs> Think about it. How many times you made decisions like, it ain't about I could get higher, it's just I can stay at this level anywhere. Why not go somewhere better? That was kind of the Miami Heat thought process, one of the slices of why they chose Miami collectively. It's just like, well, we going to just struggle. Let's struggle there and then figure this out. But they obviously added it up to two championships in four years. Let's talk about why... 
Dame, you can't be scared. And I know you're not, big dog, because we and you have communication, and I just watch you play, and I know that you ain't scared. But sometimes the persona could be scared, even though the individual and his character fears nothing. And that persona is dealing with fan backlash or what it's going to do to your legacy. And look, you got so many endorsements and brands and connections to sponsors. I get you got a lot more on your plate than the average Joe. But let me tell you what's on the plate of those organizations, those sneaky organizations, especially in the NBA. When they sign them a great player at the NBA draft, they sit there quietly and whisper, hey, you know we got them locked up for seven years. Why? Because they got you on your NBA draft deal, and if you're a beast, they know they're going to sign you to a max deal early, and then that's going to take you to seven years minimum. Think about it, LeBron and all those guys. That's why I support Acho and the big board and what he showed. Then after that, they start getting into the whole loyalty and look what you've built in terms of legacy if you're struggling. If you're winning, they ain't got to say anything. They just keep giving you max deals till you get to your bird rights and you get a super max. They know how the game goes. This is really simplistic, but the players don't understand how they're getting railroaded and played in these situations. So then you get the seven-year line of demarcation, franchises giggling at you, selling you more loyalty, more loyalty, knowing that it's never going to come to fruition, but keep lining our pockets, and you're sitting there stuck. And then finally, you realize they were selling you loyalty about your legacy when your legacy could have took the biggest bump if you would have went somewhere. So go through that force field of fear. Dame Lillard and Thinton it in. Join my Clippers. Coming up, the Suns are one win away from the NBA Finals. Yes, sir, we need you. You did all that just to say join the Clippers? You're damn right. We'll tell you if the series will be over after tonight's game. Where's some hate you. back I boy? actually That's hate you. Next on Speak. Marcellus's Clippers are in a must-win situation tonight sure. after losing Saturday to the Suns. Yeah. Paul George will need some help since our own Chris Haynes says Kawhi Leonard is highly unlikely to even travel to Phoenix. Now, head coach Ty Lue still seems optimistic, saying, quote, we beat Utah and won four games in a row. So it's very, very doable. Added an extra berry just for impact. <laughs> All right, Slick Rick Buker is back with us, but Marcellus... Is the Clippers Sun Series over? No, it's not over. You in that pass fail class again? You were talking about shocking. Damn. Shocking that Marcellus would say that. I mean, look, I mean, some <laughs> things are right under your nose. You don't even got to think about it. They play tonight, so no, the series is not over. As I check my watch right now, it's only one game. <laughs> so yeah, the series ain't over. We got games to play. You notice I made it plural, not singular, because Ty Lu. Ooh, have I seen Ty? Which, which one is looser? Okay, have I seen Ty Lue before down 1-3 and come back even on a bigger stage than this? Yes, I did. Yeah. Now, Paul George, this is not on you. And I'm glad Acho finally cleaned his act up from the A block to now where we are because he said Paul George needs some help. Yeah, let's talk about that help. Reggie Jackson, just be a little more efficient. Terrence Mann, start. Ty Lue's been almost perfect these playoffs in terms of his adjustments. Here's one that failed. <laughs> Whoa. When we had Terrence Mann out there starting, we won that game. Then we got cute. And then we said, oh, let's put Morris back out there. Mm, that didn't go so well because Morris, oh, my God, still not himself. Four points, two for eight shooting. And then when we did make our run in the third quarter, guess who helped us make our run? Terrence Mann. So let's start Terrence Mann. I don't care how he looks. I don't care what you know in the analytics. Terrence Mann's the energizer bunny, and he has the confidence that he doesn't know enough to know that this is a big stage and that he could go out there and take advantage of it. All of that said, Ty Lue will lead the charge once again, one at a time. This is not a daunting task. It's tough. Yeah, but if we take it one at a time, like Coach used to say, stop looking at me like that, Acho. <laughs> we go out there and we handle business. I, trust me. This is a gangster sweep. I told y'all that before. I was trying to be on the fence of a, uh, 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 a grown man sweep and a gangster sweep. This is gangster sweep. We win in seven. Clips in seven. Facts. <laughs> y'all not anybody? Help. Um, y'all don't believe me or y'all just think I'm funny? Look, Sal, so let's start here. Let's start here. Right. Ty Lue did lead a team back from down, you know, 3-1. Don't say three, LeBron's right. name and then I'm listening. Okay. Well, the kid from Akron <laughs> was also a part of that it, team. And the kid from Akron is the only reason that team came back from down 3-1. Where the you kid not, from Akron at right now? give Ty Lue credit where Ty Lue does not necessarily deserve the majority of it. More importantly, though, teams have a 0.49% winning percentage of winning a series when down 3-1. That means every team that's ever gone down 3-1, one out of every 200 times it happens, they come back to win the series. One out of every 
hundred times. Sell. Hmm? You know this series is over. No, it's I don't. unfortunate. No, I don't. Because I like talking Clippers ball with you. I've grown in my knowledge of the Clippers, Clip City, Chip City. I feel like a little bit more of an underdog in life just by osmosis, just by sitting here with my dog. But it's a wrap. You're wearing our colors, too. It's game over. Now, why is it game over? Because you can come back from down two games against a team you are better than, a la the Dallas Mavericks, a la the Utah Jazz. You can be down 2 0, come back. You Open your eyes if you're about to say what you're going to say. No, no, I got to close my eyes when I think about good thoughts sometimes. <laughs> but you can't come back down two games against a team that's better than you. Man, I knew you were going to say, close your eyes again, pray. <laughs> you better pray again. You the hell? Come way back better than these dudes. From down two games against a team that's better than you, Slick. You talk to them because I can't get through the hard headed goals. Slick, Slick ain't crazy like you. <laughs> Slick ain't saying that. You know, Celis, that you know Acho is confident in his argument when he gets his therapist's voice. He starts <laughs> to go, oh, look, Cel. Uh, I hate to do this, but I just gotta break it to you. I just. <laughs> Where's yep. the couch? Yep. Oh, no, uh, Marcellus, I am with you. No, the series is not over. Game four. What? The Clippers shot five for 31 from three point range. They are the best three point shooting team in the league. If they hit Hi. one more three, like it's a there. different game. The only blowout in the first four games is owned by the Clippers. The three Suns wins were all a last possession situation could have gone either way. And I, one of the things that I'm hearing that really bothers me is this idea that the Clippers are losing because they're fatigued. They've had to play 17 playoff games already. And Paul George is averaging 40 minutes a game, the, has played the most minutes of any guy in, in the little playoffs little so far. You know how many playoff, you know how many minutes he averaged back in 2014 and 2013? Mm. He averaged more minutes per mm. game. Oh, and oh, he played oh. more games oh. overall. You know, the reason we didn't make a deal out of it is because, number one, this load management and rest has become this overarching thing that is so important. But the reality is there were 10 more players who averaged more minutes than he did. And in 2013, LeBron James played 23 games, averaging way more than 40 minutes, and ended up winning a championship. So this Damn. idea that the Clippers are fatigued or that uh, somehow they've run their course because they've had to play too many games, I, I just, look. Can the Suns win the series? Absolutely. They can win, they can win the series. But the fact that the Clippers are down 3-1, the way this series is gone, the Suns are not a dominating team. How many, how many mm. playoff series have they closed I'm out? I'm done listening. In the history of this group. I'm done listening to this nonsense. I'm done listening to this nonsense. This year, that's it. They're not proven. They're not a proven team. So... I do believe the Clippers can crawl their way back. Time out. I need a full. I need a full time mm -hmm. out. You full. Now bring you full Marcellus of it. on the screen. You full of it. Here is a problem. <clears throat> you can tell by Marcellus's, I guess, lack of hair, if you will, and by Slick has a young energy, so he's a little deceptive. But you can tell a little bit that these two gentlemen are further away from knowing the physical differences between being 23 years old and 30 years old. <laughs> now, because I'm 30, I genuinely know exactly the difference between how much energy I had at 23 versus how much I have now at 30. Wow. Now, <clears throat> Paul George in 2013-14, Slick Rick, was 23 years of old age. Paul George right no. now is... 30 years of age, Slick Rick. So if the premise of your argument, or at least one of the foundational building blocks of your argument, is that Paul George is still as youthful by play as he was at 23, I must tell you, <laughs> as a seasoned 30-year-old, that is no longer the case. But furthermore, Slick, I'm a little... I'm flabbergasted by your take, Slick. Marcellus, I understand. Mm. He's a Clippers fan. He believe that, all that. Clips, clips but you, Slick, you're such an astute analyst, I don't understand how you can look beyond the fact that the Suns shot 20% from three, 36% yeah. from the field. The Suns did not make a three-pointer in the second half. They were 0 for 9 yeah. from three in the second half, and they still won. Disregard that. We know in really close games, Slick, there are going to be a couple toss-up games. There have been two toss-up games in the first four. Game four was a toss-up game. Game two was a toss-up game. 
The Suns won both of the toss-up games. In a series, it's 50-50, if we want to call it that. Say the Clippers and Suns are evenly matched. The Suns stole two of the games that were there to be sto stolen. Mm. Just like, remember, Bucks nets Evenly matched series with the players down. The Bucks stole an extra toss-up game. For those two mm. reasons, Slick, that's why I'm out on you and Marcellus. The series is over because the Suns stole the games that were there for the taking. I actually, I actually appreciate that that aspect of it because that is the one thing that gives me pause is the fact that the Clippers have had opportunities, <clears throat> as you say, to steal the game and the Suns stole it instead. Mm -hmm. But when I look overall at who the Suns are, do I think that there's some dominant team where it was the Clippers had to steal one of those games in order to win this series? That's where I stop short because. The Suns, as of right now, let's not forget, we're talking about a Devin Booker who has a broken nose, who has not, since they've made some defensive adjustments, has not shot the ball well in multiple games so mm -hmm. far. And now we're relying on a Chris Paul, a 36-year-old Chris Paul, mm. who, God forbid, if the Clippers win game five, and this becomes 3-2, and we begin to start thinking about, oh, my goodness, <laughs> we got 3-1 happening all over again because we got the reverse here with Chris Paul. There's a reason he doesn't want to talk about 3-1, mm. being up 3-1, because mm. he's been up 3-1, mm. and he's seen that not succeed ultimately. So, Acho, I appreciate, I appreciate your point. It is one of the reasons why I thought and why I think that the Clippers may have missed their best chance of winning this series. But to suggest that the series is over because the Suns are up 3-1, I need a more dominant, experienced, proven Suns team for me to believe that they have already knocked out this Clippers team. I just believe with all the changes that the Clippers have made, the way they did play against Utah, the way they played without Kawhi Leonard, that they're still capable of clawing their way back into the series. And this is why I'm certain that we're the better team and we should have the better outcome despite being down one game to three. That's my point. Coven, our producer, reminded me that in that closeout series against Utah in that game, we had 80 in the second half of that closeout game. And then when we played on Saturday, we had 80 for the total game against Phoenix. So when it's not a toss-up, which team is better? Slick just said it. We know the numbers support it. It's the Clippers. Look at us. We're on a roller coaster ride, and we lost two 50-50 games. But they're on steady, steep, consistent decline. They went from 120 game one without Chris Paul, 104 game two without Chris Paul, 92 with Chris Paul, 84 with Chris Paul. Uh-oh. Devin Booker injured. Whatever you want to call it. The problem is we figured them out defensively. All we need to do is just hit our average amount of shots, especially from three. And let's talk about this because I got to point this out. I got to do my job. Paul George, look, he wanted to start the game from the outside on Saturday. I get it because DeAndre Ayton is out there doing his thing in the paint. But after making seven of 12 three-point attempts in the first three quarters of this series, George only made five of 31 threes over the past 13 quarters. Five of 31. Then in the game four, he hits the first three in the first quarter. After that, missed his final six three-point attempts of the night. Can't tell him to stop shooting because I can't tell our team to stop shooting from the three. But damn it, find a balancing act right there because that game was too close for comfort and we should have won it. We'll see. But clips in seven. Coming up, the books. The Bucks inch closer to the NBA Finals with a big win Sunday. That's called a gangster sweep. We'll tell you if they're the best team left in the playoffs. That's next on Speak for Yourself. The Bucks took game three last night behind 71 points from Giannis and Chris Middleton. Trey Young suffered an injury in the third quarter and had an MRI today. He was diagnosed with a bone bruise in his right foot. Ouch. And it's questionable for game four. The Bucks win prompted Charles Barkley to call them the best team left in the playoffs. Slick Rick is back with us, but Acho, are the Bucks the best team left in the playoffs? Absolutely, they are the best team left, and I do not think it's close. Now, I don't think the Bucks are going to win the NBA championship, oddly enough, because I don't think they will play their best. I believe the Suns will win when they meet the Bucks, and the Suns will win in six. However, it's my job to answer the question, and it's my job to do my job. Bucks have the best, best player left in the playoffs. Giannis yeah. is better than Book. Giannis is better than Trey. Giannis is better than 
uh, Reggie Jackson. Um, the Bucks also have the best second Ooh. best player, Marshall. Just Jackson. slide that one in <laughs> there. No, 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 no. I'm trying to get these notes over here and not be rude, but Bucks, boy, you can't wait to I talk. <laughs> the Bucks also have the best oh, second best player in the playoffs in Chris Middleton to question mark for the Hawks. Uh, I don't even know, Suns, who you want to go with. You can say Chris Paul if we assume he's back fully healthy. Uh, and again, really, Reggie Jackson for the Clippers. So the Bucks just got the better players. The Bucks have the more talent. But I think the biggest thing with the biggest note is this. If you're ever trying to ascend to the mountaintop, we all know you got to fall first. And the Bucks have already taken their lashes. The primary starters <laughs> for the Suns, they hadn't even been there before. This is their first time in the playoffs. Hawks, we know they're a heroic story, but they haven't been there before either. But the Bucks have been to the conference finals and been to the conference semifinals two of the last two years. With that being said, they've been here and they've lost. Thus, they will know how to get here and conquer and win. Bucks are the best team left. <laughs> ah. All right, so Acho, I, I, I really I was able to pinpoint exactly where you and I disagree because no... I don't see them as the best team left in the playoffs because I make a distinction between being the most talented team, which you also called them, mm -hmm. and being the best team. How can you hmm. be the best team if you're not capable of winning it at all? And according to you, they are not going to win at all. That doesn't compute for me. Oh, and child. the statistics and the percentages <laughs> favor me. The names favor you. The past accomplishments, Giannis Antetokounmpo being mm -hmm. a two-time MVP, favors you. Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton and Brooke Lopez, all those names favor you. But the statistics in this playoffs favors me because they are the worst three-point shooting team left among the team standing. Mm -hmm. They are the worst free-throw shooting team left among the team's Standing. In fact, they may be the f the worst free throw shooting team, if I'm not mistaken. Oh no, they're the, also the most turnover prone team left standing. And none of that would be a problem if it weren't for the fact that they also take the second most threes of any team standing, and they are dead last among all playoff teams in free throw attempts. And that is my issue that yes, I could make the case possibly that they are the most talented team, but the way that they play does not take advantage of their strengths and does not hide their weaknesses. And so for that reason, there is no way in hell, whether I say it in this voice or I just say it not <laughs> in my therapist voice, I wish I could go along with you on your Milwaukee choice, but the reality is they're just not the best <laughs> in the playoffs. Wait, wait, wait. You got to reconcile, too, and do your prayer hands and say, people, I'm here for you guys. I'm empathetic. And the only reason I Acho even said that take and is empathetic is because Giannis is Nigerian. We know you went there, so Slick, you couldn't follow him all the way there because you're not Nigerian. And I am, 61%, 23 and me told me. I finally found out. Okay, that's cool. So, Acho, I'm going to go against my people. And then I'm going <laughs> <laughs> say, the, the best coast is the West Coast, homeboy. The East got the least. We down 1-3. Three. 3-1 three, is like people will say, but it's really 1-3. We down in our series, and we still better than them dudes. If Phoenix finishes the game and finishes the series tonight, they're better than them. All they got is names, but they ain't got the game. Everything Slick said, dead on. Let me add, add this. Bucks are averaging 109 points a game this postseason. Tenth, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Tenth amongst all playoff teams. The hell, they can't do this. They are disjointed. Like you look at them from the outside, and you see Giannis up here. You see Chris Milton up here. But then you look at the rest of the house. You're like, Whoa, who gonna fit in that room? Cause it's way down here. You ever go to somebody's house like that? You're like, where, the, where your furniture at? Where are the rest of the stuff at? Oh, it's minimalism. I'm like, nah, you ain't just ain't got nothing in here. That's the rest of this team. <laughs> minimalism. They ain't got enough. Like you got Giannis up here, vaulted ceiling. You got Chris Milton, eight foot, maybe ten foot ceiling, pin on the home. Rest of this stuff, I got a squat to get in. Man, get out of here, Drew Holiday. No shots at you, big dog. But that ain't enough. Y'all, y'all can't score with the rest of these teams. So one, I hate you because it's not even the minimalistic part. It's when you go to somebody's house and you got to say this word. This house is so quaint. Quaint. You got <laughs> to start using play. words like quaint just to be like. <laughs> oh. Honestly, it's just small, but yeah, so it's so quaint, so cozy. 
<laughs> yeah, it's really a home. I hate you, though. I hate you because I, I hate you because I hate your point. Um, it's the Bucks, and it's the Bucks for this reason. If Giannis is off, which we've seen him be off, it can be Chris Middleton. If Middleton is off, and we know he can be off, it can be Giannis. Hmm. Think of what happened with the Clippers. PG's off. He goes five for twenty. Nobody is there to save the day. Think of what happened with the Suns. Book drops forty. Then all of a sudden, Book has a whole face issue. Game three, he drops fifteen. Nobody is there to save the day, particularly because Campaign also messed up his ankle, so you couldn't count on Campaign to give you his 29. But now, let's talk about the Bucks. Game seven against the Nets. Giannis, he said, okay, Middleton, you do your thing, big dog. You go ahead and make a shake. Yeah. Giannis, uh, Middleton misses the first two shots. Holiday, do your thing, big dog. You go ahead and make a shake. You got some all-star type of talent at times. Holiday misses the first two shots. Giannis says, you know what? I'm done with y'all. Give me the rock. Giannis goes to the cup, bucket, game over. They win the series. Think about the game last night against the Hawks. Uh, Giannis was like, Middleton, you do your thing again, big dog. Let's see what you got. Middleton drops 20 points in the fourth quarter, outscoring the Atlanta Hawks by himself. No other team remaining in the playoffs has that luxury as long as Kawhi doesn't return. No other team has two stars that can go out there and take over the game and allow the other star to sit back and chill. If Book, Devin Booker sits back to chill, the Suns will start scrambling, trying to find life. If PG sits back to chill, we just saw what happened. The Clippers will lose. If Trey Young sits back to chill, we saw what happened last night. He went to the locker room, ankle stepped on the ref's foot. All of a sudden, the Hawks lose their way. But the Bucks are the one team that can say, all right, you superstar, go get it. All right, you superstar, you go get it. And they have enough talent between those two to get the job done. Yeah, Otto, I think you're confusing, though. You're confusing most talented and healthiest with best. Because okay. the reality Ooh, is okay. they are, without question, the most healthy team left standing. Uh, they, they're <clears> not missing any big pieces, as you could argue that every other single team is. But that's also my issue in that being healthier and being healthier than every team they've played in the playoffs so far, and yet they've still struggled at times. It's self-inflicted wounds. That's what worries me about the Bucs, is that they don't always play their best basketball and their best <clears throat> style. How long did it take for Giannis Antetokounmpo to finally decide, you know what, the three-point shot really shouldn't be part of my game. I need to get two feet into the paint every time. It took a while. Mike Budenholzer, not playing Bobby Portis in the first game, not playing everybody uh, in his starting lineup, almost 12 minutes in the fourth quarter, and they run out of gas. And suddenly, what happened? They end up losing a game they had no business losing. They are, without question, the better team <coughs> in this series. I could make the case that they've been the better team without question in every series so far, and yet it has taken extra measures for them to win. When they get to the next round, if and when they get to the next round, I expect that they will. They will, for the first time, be facing a team that is better than they are. For real. I'm going to take you into the mind of the Phoenix Suns and the Clippers, who are sitting there right before pregame, probably right after shoot-around, watching us right now, as everybody does, all athletes. And they sitting there looking at this, laughing at Acho over there, trying to say it's them. Acho, do you ever go to the Source Awards? Did you ever go? No? Mm -hmm. A little too young for that? Yeah, I didn't think so, yeah. Sound like you were in the crowd, though, because sound like you ain't got no love for the West Coast. You ain't got no love for Snoop Dogg. All oh, y'all out there, old heads, y'all know what I'm talking about. All right, <laughs> speaking of this matchup, Hawks Bucks <laughs> Easter Conference Finals. <laughs> Game five is featured. <laughs> Google that. On the free to play Fox Bet Super Six app. Download the app and answer six questions about Thursday's game for your shot to win $1,000. Coming up, how much pressure are Lamar Jackson and John Harbaugh under this season in Baltimore? We'll answer that next on Speak for Yourself. Gotta check YouTube for that one out there. Gangster. Let's head to Baltimore. Let's We're according to our guy, Bucky Brooks. The duo of Lamar Jackson and head coach John Harbaugh are under a lot of pressure this season. Why is Bucky putting everybody under pressure? <laughs> Bucky says questions persist about Lamar's pocket passing ability, adding, quote, the pressure is mounting on John Harbaugh to diversify the offense to give the Ravens a better chance of advancing in the tournament. The tournament the towards tourney. the Super Bowl. I love the tournament. So, Sal, yep. how much pressure are Harbaugh and Lamar Jackson under this season? I can't lie and say they're not under some pressure, but it's the same pressure they were under last year when they took that bump up. So let's just do it again. Let's take that bump up. They won in the playoffs finally last year. Now we got to win another game in the playoffs. Not necessarily win it all because your young star quarterback is 24 years young. 
Why is everybody so hypercritical of Lamar Jackson and his exploits? Stay off the enchiladas. This is the problem. If you look at Lamar Jackson, first player in NFL history, anytime somebody say NFL history and then say first, shut up anything else in criticism. 7,000 passing yards, 2,500 rush yards over his first three NFL seasons. Look at this dude, what he's doing with a coach, John Harbaugh, one of only 11 coaches all time with a Super Bowl title go along with a win percentage of over 625. So where the criticism going to go? Like, and where is it going to land? You can shoot, 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 blank, blank, blank. I don't see how you can hit these guys. They're building something out there. They're tinkering with the formula. We're going to go deeper in the passing game. Greg Roman's going to do his thing this year, whatever it may be. Just keep improving, not necessarily reach the destination, and that's all I want to see. I agree with the first part of your statement because I think they're under a lot of pressure, but only sell because they may have hit their ceiling. That's the question. Ooh, if, the, oh. if the Ravens don't excel this year, then people will wonder, yo, have they tapped out and maximized their abilities? And what we know about recent NFL history, regardless of how good the coach is or how good the quarterback is or the sec success that they have had, mm -hmm. if they've reached their ceiling, one of them got to go. Let's start in Dallas Cowboys land. Let's go. Dak Prescott, Jason Garrett. Dak starts off 13 and 3. But then all of a sudden, 9 and 7, 10 and 6, 8 and 8. Okay, I think we've hit our ceiling with this combination. Garrett, you got to go. Let's talk about the Los Angeles Rams. Sean McVay, Jared Goff, 11 and 5. Then they go 13 and 3. Get to the Super Bowl. But then they go 9 and 7, and I believe they had a 10 or 11 win season this past. Ah, Y'all reached your ceiling. Goff, mm. you got to go. Let's talk about your guy, Jimmy G. Jimmy Garoppolo, mm, they start off with Kyle Shanahan. He wins his first six games, and the next year, 13-3, and three, go to the Super Bowl. But then this past year, Jimmy G gets hurt. It's a bumpy terrain. Man, I think we've reached our ceiling. Jimmy G, we're going to bring in a replacement. You ain't got to go now, but you're going sometime soon. <laughs> I got to get out of here. That says the same thing with me about Lamar Jackson and John Harbaugh. We know mm. Lamar Jackson is amazing, mm. and we know John Harbaugh is a Super Bowl-winning coach. But mm. Lamar starts off 6-0, and amazing. 13-2, and amazing. 11 and 4 this past season. Amazing. Mm. But then it's a matter of have y'all hit your reached your ceiling? Cuz if the Ravens have reached their ceiling, if they digress this year or do not advance mm. this year, I think people will start to look around and say, "Yo, one of y'all, oh, one of y'all got to go." And the one is probably going to be Harbaugh. I can't argue that. I could just give you additional evidence that's contrary to that. Peyton Manning started off slow as it gets. Mm -hmm. John Elway, excuse me, started off even slower mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of championship success. Now, making it to the Super Bowl, yeah, John Elway did that early, didn't work out. Finally got his two chips and said, peace, uh, right off into the sunset. We know Peyton Manning finally got his after year after year of falling short. I don't think they're close to their ceiling. Let's go after that. Ravens had the number one scoring offense 2019 for the first time in their franchise history under Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson had the fifth most passing touchdowns, fifth best passer rating the last two years, on top of being the best dual threat quarterback we have. That doesn't sound like a ceiling to me. One of three quarterbacks with 25 touchdowns, 10 interceptions or fewer in his first two seasons. Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers, the other two. Come on, man, get off this dude. Leave him alone. Best regular season record since Lamar Jackson has taken over as starting quarterback. Not the Saints, not the Chiefs, not the Seahawks, not the Packers, not the Bills. It's the Ravens. Coming up, is it crazy to say the Browns have the most complete roster in the NFL? We'll answer that hmm. next. Oh, there go Baker. Don't speak for yourself. Duck, Baker, duck. Browns won their first playoff game since 1994 last season. So what's next? NFL.com wrote Cleveland has the most complete roster in the NFL. Even better than the Super Bowl champion Bucks and the Chiefs. They added, quote, they aren't just good. They're loaded with Pro Bowl talent from top to bottom. So, Acho, is it crazy to say your Browns have the most complete roster in the NFL? No, sir. I actually think that they do. Um, the Browns, when you talk about they have the best running back tandem and running back core in the NFL. Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt. I think it's unequivocally. I don't even think you can dare argue that. Browns have the best offensive line. In the NFL, they were graded as the best run blocking, blocking offense, best pass blocking offense. Browns actually have one of the better receiving cores. We just ain't seen Odell Beckham healthy in about a year and some change. Okay. So put Odell Beckham plus Jarvis Landry plus a competent head coach who knows how to utilize those pieces. Mm. I think they'll make noise. <laughs> 
Browns have a defensive player of the year favorite, not just a player of the year candidate, but favorite in Miles Garrett. Yes. And then we know how they've bolstered up their secondary. You draft a first-round cornerback in Greg Newsom, pair him with the first-round cornerback in Denzel Ward. You get a Thorpe Award winner back from injury, uh, Grant Delpit. You drafted him in the second round last year. He tore his ACL. He's back. I just don't see any holes with the Browns team. The only reason it could be argued they're not the most complete is because if you think their quarterback is bottom tier, uh -oh. that's your only argument. Uh. But as long as you realize the value of who Baker Mayfield is, what Baker Mayfield's done, oh, and how value. he will continue to ascend with that head coach, mm. I think the Browns are the most complete roster. Well, I, I, I love that B-Rabbit in you, that eight-mile come out at the end. Uh, you don't know the value of Baker Mayfield, then you don't know football. <laughs> most important position, y'all ain't got nobody who played in the Pro Bowl. So don't talk about pro bowlers from the top and bottom. He under the ground? He in the heavens? He on the roster? He ain't in the Pro Bowl yet. Here we go. I hate this world. I hate this world sometimes, but I love living in it. No, it's not crazy to say they have one of the most complete, if not the most complete roster. But they don't have the best roster. It's one of, not the. Let's, let's clarify that. I don't like this world because we reward good to great more so than we do great to great. Because we get bored with success. We're going to look at Tampa and start slighting them just because it's Tampa. They're running the same roster out mm -hmm. there again. That's what happens so many times in this world. Drake dropped a bomb album. It's up here. He dropped another bomb album. It's up here. You give him love, but then all of a sudden he's like, who's next and up and coming? Where's the next emerging artist? Man, stop. Cleveland, if Cleveland's so damn good with this roster, materialize it, partner. You want to hear this? 16th in total offense. 24th in passing offense. Don't sound like the completed roster can complete the task to me. 23rd and third down defense. I know y'all Cleveland people think I hate y'all. I don't. And 21st in <laughs> points allowed. 28th in the NFL passing attempts per game and 9th in the AFC in takeaways. Y'all ain't no top nothing except in talent. Except it's not good enough. It's one of, not the. Here's the kicker, though, Sal. I think we realize the ascending teams deserve more credit than we typically give them because the ascending team, you don't know where they're going to start. Stop. Great to great, you kind of know the limitations of the greatness. What do you mean, but Super Bowl champs? But the person... Okay, let's go. <laughs> we're going Tampa Bay. We got but... about seven minutes left we going? in the show. We're going to track and field. Where we Sorry, going? Sydney Yes. I knew you were going to go Sydney Blocker. She got that I like my dog because my dog knows trash. She ran Okay, Dalila Muhammad. Beast. Dalila yeah, Muhammad, a 400-meter yeah. hurdler, no. had the world record. And a world record, not American, the world record. Record everybody ever ran up until yesterday. Yeah. Fastest to ever run. I think she ran 52.2 seconds. World record. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But there was an up-and-comer, Cindy McLaughlin. Oh. Up and coming. And the reason we looked at Cindy McLaughlin, because we were like, we don't know your peak. Yeah. Delilla, she's a 52-2. Yeah. She has a world record, so she's the best that has ever done it. Give her her flowers. But we kind of know her peak. We don't know Sydney's peak. Yesterday, Sydney shatters the world record because she was ascending and beat Delilah in the race. They both ran phenomenal races. Mm. The Cleveland Browns, we don't know their peak. Now, we know the Bucs won the Super Bowl, and they are going to run it back. Figuratively, they were the world record holders. Yes. But we do not know what Beautiful. the Cleveland Browns going to do because uh. the Cleveland Browns could shatter uh. that figurative world record in a route to beating the Bucs like Delilla got beat by Sydney. Track and field, baby. That was a perfect take, so I won't butcher it and try to add something to it. That was an amazing race. I watched that oh, thing. I like that. But Sydney, we she ain't Cleveland. She more than Cleveland. Don't right, you go right, there? Right. We knew Cleveland. Oh, we knew Sydney from hello. All right, coming up. Oh, that was a good one. Damn, Acho. Good. It's <laughs> win or go home time for my Clippers. Make up an analogy like that for my Clippers. Make them <laughs> beat a record. Let's do it. We'll tell you if they'll survive game five tonight. On speak for yourself. That's real. I saw Sydney in high school. Did you? Marcellus' says Clippers could be eliminated tonight by the Suns. And unless what? And what? they get a win on the road to extend the series. Reports say Kawhi Leonard is highly unlikely to travel to Phoenix. So, Paul George, excuse me, playoff, way off peace. Man, oh! We'll oh, have to oh, show oh, up tonight. Oh, Sam, yeah. what? Yo, Clippers gonna survive game five? How to survive in South Central. A place where busting the cap is fundamental. Yes, we gonna survive this. I'm telling you, Ty Lue will exercise the demons. Clippers franchise, we're not cursed. But I will admit, 3-1 sounds a little weird when you hear it as a Clippers fan. But we about to flip it. We about to... S <laughs> what you got to say? Y'all ain't got a chance, big dog. Y'all really don't. And it's unfortunate because, again, I love the show when we got the Clippers you in. You betting? I hope y'all... 
I'm talk. not betting this one. I'm not betting this one. Well, I don't think no chance, chance, you said. Playoff Pete, he ain't been making no noise. Reggie Jackson, he about ain't about to drop 30. To and curse. what you want, Terrence Mann to come save today again? It's a wrap. Game over. It's blouses. Why? Why are you doing this? They have been declining in point production every single game. And y'all still you know down? Why? What? Y'all still, down still losing? I know. What the hell? <laughs> we just not good with the 50-50s. We like to blow them out. Tonight, blowout. Clips by 10 plus. I bet all of America a penny each. Let's do it. That's it for That's us. Fox Bet Live is next. How much is that? Yeah, like three.